All right, good morning. And peace be with you. Also with you. All right, here we are. It is, it is, it is good to be uh, back here uh, in person. Yeah, um, y'all, y'all give yourself a hand. Uh, give the Lord a hand. Um, I, I, obviously, you know, we're not at full capacity and we don't have kids worship. Our kids are going to be uh, loud and proud. And uh, y'all just, uh, l- yeah, love, love on them. Love on them throughout the service as they are just doing their thing. Uh, but it is just good to be back uh, here uh, with, with, with you guys. And uh, just looking forward to, to what the Lord is going to do uh, this morning in our time together. Uh, and so just to, to get that started, I want to pray uh, for our time together. So if you all want to bow your heads, we're going to ask the Lord to, to, to bless our time together. Father God, we do thank you for uh, this morning. We thank you for... Um, the opportunity to to be in your house uh, together uh, as a body of believers, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray this morning that you would be uh, glorified and uh, that you would be at the center of our time of worship, that you would be at the center uh, of our time uh, of giving, that you would just be at the center of everything that Pastor Jim speaks on this morning, Lord, that it would all center around you, Lord Jesus, because our lives uh, and everything that is is centered around you. And so, God, we give you this time uh, this morning asking, Lord, that you would just bless uh, this time, Lord. I pray for each and every family that is here this morning, that's represented here this morning. Uh, Lord, you know um, what the last month or two has looked like. Lord, you know each and every one of our paths, Lord, as we uh, gather here today, Lord. Uh, you're very aware of it, and you're very involved in it. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would bless each family. And, uh, God, we just thank you for the great love that you have for us, that you uh, have gone ahead and prepared a place for us, Lord, where you are, we will also be. And, Lord, I just thank you for uh, the promises that are in your word. And, Lord, I thank you for um, the love that you have for us, and I thank you for your love demonstrated at the cross for us, uh, and while we were yet still sinners, Lord, you died for us. And, um, Lord, we're just eternally grateful for that sacrifice and for that demonstration of love. And so, Lord, for that for that reason and for that reason alone, Lord, we celebrate you this morning. And again, Lord, we just ask that you would bless everybody who's here, everybody at home who's watching, um, and just uh, have your way uh, in this time together. Lord, we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love. 
Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, and he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, Jesus, Jesus, the name above every Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
above every other name. I love your name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. So we live for you. Dear Lord, again, we are just once again and continually reminded that there is no one, no one like you. And Lord, that we can build a firm foundation in you because when everything else is shaken, you are unshaken. And so I pray, Lord, as we again in these days and these times when we do see so many things that are shaken, that we establish and build our life upon you, that firm 
foundation. And so, Father, now at this time as we pray, we just pray, Father, for just the tithes and the offerings, not only of this body of Christ, Lord, but we just are reminded of, Lord, just your provision, your faithfulness. And so, Father, we just pray that as we just continue to take one step at a time, one day at a time, that, Father, that we know that we can trust you in all things, in all things, including our finances. And so, Father, bless, bless the tithes, bless the offerings. And, Lord, we also just pray that as we continue to, as we give, that you would just continue to not only use them for to the work of your ministry here in Hartwood, but, Lord, we have seen the evidence of just how you multiply and multiply and multiply. And we've seen the evidence of how you have used the faithfulness of your people in giving and use that to bless people, not only, again, here in Hartwood, but throughout the world. And, Father, as Pastor Jim brings the message, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just rest upon him and pour out your spirit upon him. And that, Lord, that you would speak through him, that our spiritual eyes and ears would be open. And that not only that they would be open, but, Lord, that the word that comes, would, that there would be a hunger. There would be a hunger for your word, a hunger to hear from you, Lord. And so I just pray, as, as Jim speaks, that it would feed us, Lord, that you would feed us through what you have given him to say to us today. So, Lord, we just continue to worship you. As Matt said earlier, we have come here for you and to worship you. And so I pray as Jim brings the message that it's just another form of us worshiping you for your honor and for your glory. Amen. Good morning. morning. 3,000 years ago, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Isn't it good to be back in the house of the Lord? Now, we know that uh, God does not live in any temple made out of stone, right? We know that. We know that uh, he's just as present outside in the parking lot in the drive-in service as he is here. But there's still something very special about coming into a house that has been dedicated to him. It becomes a sacred space, and that's a good thing. These are ultimately tools for ministry. They're not to become idols, but it's so good to be here because this really is home in so many ways. While I'm thinking about it, I just wanted to mention that uh, Phoebe Cop made some masks. Apparently, she's made a lot of these. She's, she has sewn these, and she doesn't have very many that are would be a man size uh, face, but she does have some for kids and some for women. Uh, if you'd like to take a mask, you can wash these multiple times. I think I think she said maybe 30 days. I'm not sure. You can wash them. She said she recommended not drying them in the dryer. But anyway, they are here if you would like to uh, pick one of those up. There's a cool Wonder Woman one right there, but uh, <laughs> too small for my face, I think. But uh, yeah, too bad. I wouldn't be caught dead wearing it anyway, <laughs> quite honestly. But, uh, <laughs> but if you'd like to take a mask, uh, that is, uh, they are here. <clears throat> so, all right. Well, the title for the message today is uh, Reset Next Generation. This never changes. We'll be looking at Second Peter 1, 1 through 21. I promise we will get to that passage of Scripture. It's going to take us a while before we actually read that passage of Scripture. But just a reminder... Uh, before we were so rudely interrupted <laughs> by COVID-19, uh, and so much has changed, where were we? Well, we were here, Reset Next Generation Sermon Series, supposed to be February 23rd through April 19th, 2020, and uh, here was the plan, right here, the overview, uh, and it's all alliteration there, see the alliteration, isn't that awesome? <laughs> awesome, all A's, Okay. Uh, See, I'm on a roll already. Isn't that great? Uh, And God had the audacity to interrupt my alliteration. So 
which is why I really think maybe alliteration maybe isn't godly after all. I don't know. But uh, just kidding. That's one of my standing jokes about alliteration. I don't tend to use it a whole lot, but we got as far as what's highlighted in yellow, March 15th, which was assess. So we looked at adjust, acknowledge, appreciate. We got to assess, and that's as far as we got. And then everything happened, and uh, as you know, restrictions were put into place, and we had a couple of uh, meetings that were prayer meetings on Sunday morning, and then uh, in, in response to Gov uh, President Trump's uh, request about the 15 days to slow the spread and so forth, and then we had an executive order from our governor uh, concerning no worship services inside or outside with more than 10 people present, so we had to shift gears. So we did a live stream on uh, Palm Sunday from within the building, and then uh, on Easter Sunday we had our first drive-in service, so we've had to make a lot of adjustments along the way. So here is what the plan was to move to the next topic, which would be anticipate. And I was going to share plans for a possible new sanctuary to be built as we anticipate the needs of the next generation. I was going to invite you to anticipate what God could do in this regard, a new sanctuary. Instead, we were forced to react and to respond to the unanticipated, but life has a way of throwing these kinds of things at us, doesn't it? And how we respond usually reveals who we are. If you want to find out what's inside the box of chocolates, and you don't have the little guide, right, and the Whitman sampler that tells you what's in there, what do you have to do? You either have to squeeze it and see what's inside, or you have to bite it and find out what's inside. Well, sometimes life is like that. And uh, I think some famous person named Forrest Gump said that, or a fictional person, right? Life is like a box of chocolates. All right, so how we respond to the unanticipated reveals a lot about who we are. And there have been a wide range of responses to COVID-19, a wide range of reactions, a lot of fear. Uh, certainly, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen some just hysterical reactions. We've seen some things that are way over the top. Of course, a lot of that was based on certain predictions that were made at the beginning about how awful this was going to be and how many people would die and it was going to be the end of the world, the apocalypse. And uh, we're still hearing that from certain people, even though what we've seen is that the death rate has been far lower than anticipated, far, far lower, even less deadly than the flu. Uh, and yet we still have uh, certain sectors of the, uh, uh, our society completely shut down and draconian measures in place. So wide range of reactions, even within the body, of Christ. Now, many Christians have speculated this means we are in the end times. Well, yeah, we have been ever since Jesus came the first time, but I understand what people mean. There is an end time of the end times, right? I mean, I, I get it. I understand that, and maybe we're there, maybe we aren't. A lot of people have been talking about the end times for a long, long, long time. So uh, they were talking about it 2,000 years ago. They thought they were in the end. Uh, and uh, Jesus had some words about that, and we'll look at some of those in just a little bit. So, yes, we're in the end times. We'll, we'll have to deal with whatever life throws at us, won't we, when it comes. Uh, we can wind up getting lost in speculation. We can wind up making a lot of adjustments. Uh, I, I've lived long enough to have seen many, many groups over the years, you know, go off to some cave uh, in the mountains somewhere to wait for the second coming of Christ and uh, turned out he, he didn't come on the date they said he was going to come. How about that? It, I don't know how they missed it, but uh, they did, and many, many groups have done that kind of thing, and we just can't pause our lives because we think Jesus is going to come back on such and such a date because the odds are we're not going to know when he's coming. I think he even said that, didn't he? <laughs> he's going to come like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when he's coming. Now, there are certain signs that we can look at. We see certain things beginning to happen, and we know we're getting close, so this is why we, we like to speculate, and I understand that completely, and I've received many emails, I've received all kinds of things from people that, hey, look at all this evidence, and some of it will curl the hair on your head if it's not already curly, and some of it will make your hair gray, and uh, so I've been reading some of that, and uh, there are some persuasive arguments. There, there is a lot of stuff going on right now that would certainly seem to align with the mark of the beast, uh, and so forth, and... Um, you know, technology today makes a lot of things possible that weren't possible not all that long ago, including the tracking of every person on the planet, essentially. I mean, they're talking about doing that right now to track what exposure you've had to COVID-19. A little bit scary, isn't it? Going to track where you are at any given moment, who you've been in contact with, 
big brother watching here, George Orwell, 1984, and that was a long time ago, isn't it? You know, he was really prescient in so many ways, George Orwell, about what could happen with government in full control. So who knows, you know, ultimately? Uh, many Christians believe we are on the verge of an unprecedented great awakening. I put unprecedented in italics because if you're like me, you're probably tired of hearing that word. <laughs> We've heard that word a lot. Unprecedented. This is unprecedented. We hear it almost every day. Um, well, and it is in many ways. So, and we may be on the verge of a great awakening that's unprecedented. And many Christians believe they know what that will look like. So they're praying for what they think they will recognize signs and wonders, miracles, and so on. And I get it. I understand. I understand. I've been waiting for the next Great Awakening pretty much my entire Christian life. So I have a longing for it. I want to see it. I'd love to see it before my death. I would love to see it. I may or may not. And if I don't, that doesn't mean that God isn't faithful and that God doesn't know what he's doing. Right, So we need to be really careful sometimes about what we do with these kinds of things. And we tend to say, well, you know, there are signs and wonders that accompany Great Awakenings, and that's true, often. Uh, but uh, we can get into the trap of trying to box God in, and he has to do it this way, because this is what we expect. And there were people who had made that mistake 2,000 years ago, and the Son of God stood right in front of them, and they didn't know who he was because they anticipated he would come a different way. And they crucified him. They knew the scriptures. They were godly people. They had good intentions. And they totally missed it. So we need to be very careful. Very careful. All right, so that introduces my Grinchiness, which I'm going to talk about uh, today. I hope you don't think I'm the Grinch who stole revival. By the time we finish <laughs> this message, you may decide that that's the case, but I will tell you my heart is not two sizes too small. At least I don't think it is. Um, thank you. <laughs> I do believe Great Awakening will come, but perhaps, if you ever watched How the Grinch Stole Christmas, perhaps, or as Karloff, uh, perhaps, to quote Dr. Seuss, it will come unlike how we anticipate. Is that possible? Can God really do something like that? Of course he can. Perhaps it will come in a way we do not anticipate. And again, the first coming of Jesus was completely missed by all the right people, all the experts on the scripture, all the people who wanted people to live in godly, a godly way. The Pharisees were a reform movement in Judaism. People weren't living by the law. How people should live by the law because people should be holy. You got to keep the law. They, had, they understood the scriptures. They understood where the Messiah was going to come from. All these things, and they missed Jesus when he actually came into the world. So we need to be careful, very careful. We need to trust in God, not in our own predictions and not in our own understanding. See, the Grinch, if you recall the story, took away everything that was Christmas, right? And he thought he could stop it from coming. So he snuck into the village of the Who, you know, Whoville, and he took all the toys, all the whatever, Jing Tinglers, and I can't even think of all the uh, other names that he used. Dr. Seuss is so creative. And he thought he could stop it from coming by taking all this stuff, the noise, 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 and he couldn't, he hated all that. And he discovered what? He discovered that Christmas was more than toys. It was more than all the shiny things. It was more than all the hoof hoofas or whatever. Uh, it was more than that, and he didn't understand that before. Because what happened? Christmas came. It came just the same. And perhaps Christmas was more than he had thought. And so the Grinch discovered that. So people want miracles. I get it. I get it. I really do. But do we recognize the true miracles? The true miracles of the gospel. You know, it's way too easy to project onto God what we want. And we're not even aware we're doing it. Way too easy.
It's easy to seek God's hand, his provision, rather than his face, true relationship. And we don't even realize we're doing this. We think our motives are good, they're pure. We don't even know we're doing it. We wind up seeking God's, our own glory, having some part in causing the miracle because we met to pray. We were committed to do it. And so revival came. Um, okay. Because of what you did? Maybe. Maybe there were thousands of other people somewhere else who were praying. Maybe God moved in response to their prayers. So we have to be really, really careful. Because we can do this without even being aware that we're doing it. Now, what about Jesus and miracles? Well, we all know that Jesus did miracles. John calls them signs because a sign indicates something, it points to something else. And so they were signs. They pointed to who he is. So John uses the, the word signs all through the gospel. He doesn't use the word miracle. Now, the Bible says that signs and wonders will follow the proclamation of the word of God. Notice the word follow. But what we too often do is we put the cart before the horse. We want to see the miracles, so we pray for miracles. Signs and wonders will follow the proclamation of the word. So what's primary? Is it the miracles? No, it's the proclamation of the word. It's the truth. It's the truth being told, because that's what will change people's hearts. And then often we see God move in spectacular ways. Sometimes we don't in the way we commonly think of a miracle, but I'm getting to that as we talk about miracles here today. You know, there are times in the Gospels you can practically hear the weariness in the voice of Christ when he says to the man, for example, unless you see a miracle, you will not believe. It's like, really? Again? You want a miracle? You can't just believe I am who I am. You have to see a miracle? He must have gotten so tired of that. We could sense his frustration with the religious people or the merely curious of his day who demanded miracles. Well, just show us a sign to prove who you are. Then we'll believe. Now, what's the catch there? The reality is that even if he had shown them a sign, they would not have believed. Right? Isn't that exactly what happened with the Pharisees and the scribes? They even said, look, the whole world's going after him. Well, why were they going after him? Because he raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. So what was their solution to that? Oh, he must be the Christ. Only the Christ could do that. No, their reaction was what? We've got to kill this man. And for good measure, we're going to kill Lazarus too. Because people are coming to see Lazarus alive, and that's a testimony to who Jesus is, and we can't have that, so we've got to kill Lazarus too. Their hearts were not broken by the miracle, the spectacular miracle of, of raising someone from the dead, because they're already inclined not to accept him. So Jesus just would refused to perform, didn't he, for people? See, Miracles sometimes were seen as an exciting uh, form of entertainment by people or as proof of his identity. Prove it. Prove who you are. Show me a miracle. Well, here's the danger of miracles. Jesus had no need, no ego need, to prove himself through miracles. Jesus constantly, consistently, always Refuse to perform as a trained circus seal. Show us a miracle. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Jesus refused to do that. I'm glad I kept my dignity while doing that, too. Uh, he, he just wouldn't do that. Well, show us a sign. And he said, no, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. He was in the belly of the well for three days. And then he came out. 
And he was talking about his death. His, this ignominious death, this, this horrendous, tortured death he had to suffer. That's the only sign I'm going to show you. I'm not going to perform some trick for you just to make you happy. Because you're not going to believe me anyway. You're going to find some reason to reject me no matter what. So he always refused to perform on order. You know, think about it. Who demanded Jesus prove himself through miracles first? It was the devil, wasn't it? The temptation in the wilderness. What was that all about? Hey, if you're the son of God, right, turn these stones into bread. Because he knew that Jesus was hungry. He had to be hungry. Hey, if you're the son of God, why don't you throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple? Because, you know, the angels will come and hold you up. Right? That was the temptation. Prove yourself. Prove yourself. Do something spectacular. Get a following. The devil demanded Jesus prove himself, and Jesus refused. So, if we're demanding that God prove himself through miracles, who are we most like? Jesus or the devil. You need to be very, very careful. See, this is my grinchiness coming out. Now, I love miracles. We've seen miracles. Here, we've seen them in India. When we pray for people, we've seen the blind receive their sight. We've seen the deaf hear. I'd love to see more of that because I'd love to see people made whole. But it's about the people Receiving the love of Christ is not about the miracle, right? It's not about, oh, I saw the blind receive their sight. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's awesome for you. But the point is the love of God for that individual. That's the point. It's not so you have a good story to tell, right? Because some people build their resumes by their miracle stories. And it makes them look very, very impressive. Wow. Wow. And the focus isn't on God anymore. The focus is on them. See, we do this without even being aware we're doing this. We need to be careful. Do you remember what Jesus told Thomas? The greatest miracle of all, Jesus raised from the dead. And Thomas said, like, I'm not going to believe unless I actually see his hands and I can poke my fingers in there and you know, feel the wounds. And, and Jesus says to Thomas, well, blessed are you because you, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. Plus, for those who don't see a miracle and yet they believe. There's a large portion of the church that's all caught up in miracles. Now, there's a balance here because we don't want to be to the point where, hey, there are no miracles anymore and there's nothing supernatural anymore. There's a large part of the church that's there in that camp. They all stopped 2,000 years ago. Then there's that side of the church that's Kind of on the other extreme, it's all about charismatic things and miracles and signs and wonders and the tinglies. And they get into the flesh just as easily as the people on the other end. And they start doing in church what they think happens in church. And it's just like automatic pilot. They just go right into it automatically. It's not the Holy Spirit at all. They think it is. It isn't. There's a balance here. And the balance is, what is God doing? Let's trust him. Let's not make him do anything to suit us or the way, you know, we format things. We need to be very, very careful. You know, it's interesting. People who are one to Christ through miracles often forsake him once the miracles or the chills and the thrills stop. There's an expression that says, what you win them with is what you're going to keep them with. Well, if we win people with entertainment, spectacular things all the time, constant hype, something new all the time, the latest thing, the smoke machine, the lights, whatever it is, whatever the fad is at that moment, that's what you're going to keep them with because that's why they're there. Sometimes they're there not because of Jesus. They're there because you've got all this fancy stuff, and that's exciting, and that's thrilling, and hey, that's great. And you don't really expect anything from me. I can just come and sit and enjoy the show and leave and, and live my life. But there's no real accountability here. So people who are one through miracles 
often leave once those things stopped. Once the chills and the thrills and the warm fuzzies and all that stops, they're gone. They're gone. I've seen this happen so many times. You know, the downside of living as long as I have as a pastor is you start to see these things over and over and over again. And you become a Grinch in some ways. Wiser. Wiser. And you begin to recognize what we often don't recognize when we're younger. There's so many things that can be a counterfeit to what God is actually doing. Many Christians forsake the body of Christ and wander like nomads. They go from church to church and they're looking for Holy Spirit. Well, where is the Holy Spirit? Where is he? That's right. He's right here. Till he pointed to himself. Holy Spirit lives in the body of Christ, lives in the church, the people. So you're going to forsake this assembly or some other assembly because you don't see Holy Spirit there. And you're going to go where you see Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. I promise it wasn't anything I said. So you're going to go where you see Holy Spirit because you're going to go where you see what you want to see and you get the chills and the thrills or whatever it is you think is Holy Spirit. And what's going on there is you're completely blind to the fact that Holy Spirit is in those people sitting in the seats in the sanctuary. And they're ordinary people, hardworking people who are living their lives trying to honor Christ quietly often. And you can't see that. You with me here? You following me? This has got to grieve the heart of God. Because you're not after him when you forsake his people for the experience. You're after the experience. You're seeking his hand rather than his face. You want to look into the face of God? Look at your neighbor right now because the Holy Spirit lives there. They're not God. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. Don't go out here and say, Pastor Jim said, we're all gods. I didn't say that. <laughs> Although Jesus did have an encounter about that, didn't he? And he quoted the scripture, right? Because they said, you can't, you're, you're, you're claiming you're the son of God. And he quoted the scripture back to him that even the word says, you all are gods. They didn't know what to say to that. So, but God lives in us. This is my point. And I've seen this over and over and over again. People often come here, they sense the power of the Holy Spirit here in some way. They know we walk in healing and deliverance here. They come here for a time. And then when they can't control things, they can't do whatever they want. Or they don't see as much exciting things happening as they thought they might see. Or they get out of us whatever they want to get out of us. They leave. They leave to do their own thing because they cannot come under spiritual covering or authority. They chafe at it. And they're going to go do what they want to do, see? And they claim what? It's the Holy Spirit leading them. It's the Holy Spirit leading me to forsake the body of Christ. Something doesn't add up there. To do what? To do my thing because that's what I want. Something terribly, terribly wrong here. Terribly wrong. You want to know why we haven't seen revival in the church? This is why. Because all the people who say they're after God don't even recognize God in the people. And they forsake the people to pursue God. In quotes, the Holy Spirit. Who's living in the people. Because they're after the experience. They're not after the long, hard haul of living in relationship with real human beings who have challenges like everybody else. See, many Christians manufacture their own miracles to get or to keep a following. Be very, very careful with people who have account after account after account of miracles. 
be very careful. Something's not right there. I don't care how tuned in you are to God. Every moment of every day is not a miracle encounter. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, life itself is a miracle. But I always am suspicious of anybody who seems to live on that cloud all the time. Because it's not possible. It just isn't. Even Jesus couldn't stay on the mountaintop all the time. So I tend to not trust anybody who's always on the mountaintop. It's not real. can't be real. But there are many people like this. Now, at the least, this misrepresents God. At the most, it's witchcraft. It's using spiritual power to achieve your own ends. That's the basic definition of witchcraft. You're using spiritual powers in an an unauthorized way to achieve what you want. And often these people appear very spiritual. They often have many admirers. But listen to me. Beware hype. Beware hype. And there are many, many people like this. Many. You've got to have your eyes open spiritually. You've got to be aware. They can look wonderful, but there's something that doesn't quite add up. But you've got to be aware. Be aware of what the Holy Spirit's telling you. Jesus warned us. He warned the last days would be terrible. The prophets have said the same concerning the day of the Lord. Like, why would you desire the day of the Lord? It's going to be awful. That's what the prophets said. See, do we really understand how bad it's going to be when we pray for the final harvest? The last great awakening to usher in the end, do we really understand how bad it's going to be to get there, and are we prepared? Now, I'm not saying that you stop praying for that great harvest. I'm just saying just do it with your eyes open. Understand what you're asking for. It's not all wonderful. It's going to be awful in many ways. Are we prepared or are we just living in this world of, oh, it's going to be utopia, it's going to be so wonderful? No, it's going to be awful. And you're going to suffer. Doesn't matter what your view is on the rapture and the trip, pre trib, post trib, whatever it is you're still going to be suffering along with the rest of humanity, at least through part of it, no matter what your view is, right? It's going to be terrible, the last days. Are we prepared? Maybe we're entering into them now. So Jesus warned, for then there will be great tribulations such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been shortened, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Matthew 24, 21 through 22. So feel-good Christians, the chasers of miracles, fair-weather friends of Jesus, self-advancing people, believers, they're not going to make it because it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be wonderful. It's going to be awful unless you're really in it for God himself and not for the miracles, you're not going to make it. You understand what I'm saying? We're in a time of reset right now across the globe. Maybe this is the beginning of the end. This is extraordinary what's happening right now. Never seen it before on the planet. And if it is, then we need to get our act together. We need to be ready. And we need to get out of this daydream that it's all going to be awesome and wonderful and miracles right and left and how great that's going to be and hallelujah. No, it's going to be awful. Are you ready? Hebrews tells us that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now is seated at the right hand of God the Father in glory. It wasn't for the joy of the cross, it was for the joy after the cross, after the humiliation, after the suffering, after the torture, after the death. 
Are we ready to take up our crosses and follow him? Or are we living as Christians because we think it's going to be great? It's just the opposite of what Jesus promised us. No, you're going to have tribulation in this world. They hated me. They're going to hate you. Expect it. See, we were warned. And there's more. Matthew 24, 23 through 28, continuing where we stopped. Then if anyone says to you, lo, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Look, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, it's going to be unmistakable. Wherever the body is, there the eagles or the vultures, not a pleasant image there, will be gathered together. And despite the gruesome imagery, the point seems to be that it's going to be obvious. You know something's dead because the vultures have gathered, and you can't miss it because they're circling all above that spot. So Jesus is just saying, look, don't believe individuals who say, hey, I've got it. I've got the power. I've got the answer here. No, when I come back, it's going to be obvious to everybody. Don't chase after people. Don't follow them. No matter how godly they look, no matter how spiritual they look, no matter how many miracles they offer, don't follow them. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect look I have told you ahead of time. Take the warning. How many people have followed after leaders? How many of you remember Jim Jones? Years and years ago, right? They all drank the Kool-Aid. Remember, you get that term, drinking the Kool-Aid from that? Basically, they drank the Kool-Aid to kill themselves because there were men with automatic weapons around the compound making them drink the Kool-Aid. They thought he was the Messiah. Wow. Remember Sun Young Moon and the Moonies? I mean, there's a whole long list we could go through of people. Chasing after signs and wonders and those who claim to deliver them on a regular basis is a big mistake. All right, well, with so much changing, we need to get our eyes off the superficial. We need to not settle for the trappings, for the fringe, for the appearance of church or Christianity or revival. We need to recognize God is not impressed by glitz. He is not impressed by smooth organization. He is not impressed by how many followers or friends we have on social media. He is not impressed by how many people like our posts. He is not impressed by how much publicity we generate. And there are people who look like godly people, but they generate a lot of publicity. How does that happen? You have to start asking those questions. It doesn't happen just by chance. Trust me. There's some orchestration going on there. Many Christians need to get over themselves. See, God is looking for truly transformed lives because these are the miracles of the gospel. You want to see a miracle? Look at a transformed life that's been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the miracle of the gospel. Don't go after signs and wonders. Go after transformation of human beings. That's the point. That's what a great awakening is supposed to be all about, true transformation of the culture. I told you we'd get to the scripture eventually, and here we are, Second Peter 1, 1 through 21. It only took me, I don't know how many minutes to get here. Second Peter 2. Let's see what he has to say. Simeon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's not all on the screen. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours in the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, 
that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. For this very reason, to become partakers of the divine nature, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Notice how love is at the end, just like 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is the most important. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he, is, that he was cleansed from his old sins. There's a point in being cleansed from your old sins. It's to transform your life. Therefore, brethren, be the more zealous to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never fall. So there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these things, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to arouse you by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And I will see to it that after my departure you may be able to may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received glory, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All right. Well, easy Christianity is an oxymoron doesn't exist. Here's what never changes about Christianity, is that it is all about us being transformed to be like Jesus, to love as he loves. Love is not just an emotion or a warm fuzzy. To love like Christ does not come naturally. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We do not instantly or easily become like Christ. We crucify our own flesh with its passions and desires. We yield our agendas to the agenda of Jesus himself. And this takes discipline and it takes work. 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 Discipline. Disciples are people who exercise discipline to be like Jesus. This is why Peter says, make every effort. We are saved by God's goodness to partake of the divine nature. So for this reason, make every effort. You have to cooperate with God in this endeavor to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. Notice how they build. One leads to another. You add that, you add this, you add that, you add this, you add that, you add this. And it's all about love, ultimately. You see? We need these to be effective and fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus, Peter tells us. These confirm our call and election. They are evidence of faith. It's easy to say, I believe. How do you live? Right? Right? Because if you tell me you believe in Jesus, but you live like hell, I'm going to say you're a liar. Right? Seems pretty straightforward, isn't it? Jesus said what? You'll know them by what? By their fruits. The product of their lives. What comes out of their lives? I mean, talk is cheap, isn't it? There's an awful lot of the church that's got lots of talk. Where's the evidence? Of faith. Where are these virtues that are listed here? Often they're missing. See, love is hard work. 
Well, aren't we saved by faith, not by works? Well, James 2.18 says this, Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. So they go together. Faith and works go together. Works are the product of faith. Second Peter 1 is, is dealing with the same uh, issue here. Faith that is coming to salvation by the goodness of God demands changed character. Because not only out of genuinely transformed character can we act as Christ does, loving as he loves. Too many churches have lost sight of the basic duty of the church, as stated by Jesus himself, the hard work of making disciples, producing transformed lives. You can put on the greatest show on earth, but if you're not actually transforming people's lives and doing the hard work of doing that, it's worthless. It doesn't matter how many thousands of people you have coming to your services. If there's no disciple-making happening, there's nothing good going on there. Very little anyway. Very little that will last, let me put it that way. Because it's about disciple-making. The church's priorities as expressed by Jesus himself. We call it the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all kinds of people, all nations, all ethnos, all ethnicities, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. What's first on that list? What's priority? What's the main point? It's not baptizing, is it? Making disciples. That's the point. People with transformed character, that's the goal, not large numbers of decisions for Jesus, not large numbers of salvation reports or miracle stories. These can be superficial. In a way, it doesn't really matter how many people you baptize if it's not genuine, right? Are their lives really going to be transformed? You know, people make decisions for Jesus and all, for all kinds of reasons, and then they fall away quickly. I've been a pastor long enough, and I've baptized a lot of people. And a lot of them just don't, they just don't stay. It doesn't take. I mean, you don't know the person's heart. You tried your best before you baptized them, but you don't know, right? So what's required to make disciples? Hard work, persistence, self-sacrifice, forbearance, patience, tough love, with accountability and responsibility. But this is not glamorous enough for many Christians and churches. They want to have the big event, they want to get on TV, you know, whatever it is. But there's no disciple making happening at all. It's all about the events. It's all about the services. All right, so things change, but Jesus does not, nor does the mission of the church. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13.8. Hebrews 6, 19 through 20 says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Jesus commanded us to do the work, the hard work, of making disciples. And when Jesus returns, he's going to be looking for faith. Luke 18, 8, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Well, what does faith look like? What does faith look like when it's mature? Well, Peter told us it looks like transformed lives. These are the real miracles of the gospel. So when you're praying for awakening, when you're praying for revival, don't be praying for signs and wonders. Pray for changed lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have entrusted to us the responsibility of making disciples. And you've charged us, first of all, to become like Jesus ourselves so that we can make disciples, so we can mentor them and give example to them and help to train them in godliness. And Lord, this seems so daunting, and we've, we're so aware of how inadequate we are in so many ways to do this, because we have our own, own weakest weaknesses, and we know that. But you understood that, didn't you? 
when you gave us this charge, when you gave us this commandment. You didn't expect us to be flawless, perfect human beings making disciples. You expect us to be real people, offering the hope of salvation to others and training them to live for you. Training them to do what Peter has said here, to make every effort to add to our faith, to supplement our faith with these virtues that have been named here, to really take on the character of Christ, to really look like him, all leading to loving as he loves, which means that we love self-sacrificially, we love unselfishly, we love seeking the, the well-being and the good of the other person. We love esteeming others more highly than ourselves because we have the mind of Christ. We're not putting ourselves first. Lord, that's hard because that, that just goes totally contrary to human nature. But you know that, don't you? Which is why you gave us the Holy Spirit to be inside of us, your very spirit to help us with this. But we've got to cooperate with you, Lord, so we ask that you help us. We ask, Lord, that, that as we look and as we long for and as we hope for a great awakening that will sweep the earth, that what we will see is a transformation of character, that, that we won't be trying to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. What we need is the healing from within of that, that wound. We need wholeness. We need total transformation. We need true change. And so, Lord, we cry out, for great awakening that will see the transformation of individuals. I pray for the church, Lord, that you would help us to, to gird up our loins for the hard work of making disciples. We're not even ready to receive the great harvest right now because much of the church has focused on the feel goods and we're too shallow. We don't have the substance that we need to be able to train anyone else to be a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you would prepare the churches. You would help us to understand that this time a reset is not just an interruption, and then we go back to the way it was. That you would prepare us to make fundamental changes in our awareness of what our purpose is. And that we would abandon the superficial. We would abandon the shallowness that often is offered as true Christianity. And we would be men and women who take up our crosses every day in order to love as you love. So, Lord, we cry out for true great awakening, true transformation, complete change of human beings in our nation, and across the globe. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, as unpleasant as it has been, as challenging as it has been with COVID-19. It has interrupted all of us. It's gotten our attention. It's made us think about what's really important in life. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would help the church to be challenged to think about what's true Christianity, what's really important about Christianity. Help us to zero in to the very heart and soul of what we're supposed to be about, the making of disciples. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Uh, go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Uh, we uh, have encouraged you, as you know, we have certain guidelines in place right now. And so uh, I'm going to be stepping out the back doors. I'll be out on the front porch out there so we can keep our social distancing and all of that. Um, but uh, God bless you. So good to be back together in the house of the Lord. So praise the Lord. Go out and change the world, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>